Om Namo Bhagavatevaya, Om Namo Bhagavatevaya, Om Namo Bhagavatevaya. So Hare Krishna everybody, I'd like to welcome you all. Thank you for joining, spending your Sunday afternoon, uh, at least one hour or so uh, of your time, precious time. Um, and today I wanted to look at the modern sort of arguments. When I say modern, of course, I'm maybe not completely up to date with um, the current uh, scientific theories or thinking, but the sort of modern day thinking about why, uh, uh, how uh, atheists uh, or those who don't believe in God think. And referencing that back to the scriptures, especially the Bhagavad Gita, although not exclusively, um, how those arguments are not necessarily um, uh, plausible. So the concept, the subject today is Ishwar, God, and also uh, if we get time, we also uh, will have a look at um, what are the what are the qualifications of Ishwar? Who can be regarded as Ishwar, God? Because we know, um, especially in Bharat, um, practically on every street corner, there is an incarnation of God. <laughs> so we need to be careful um, because not everybody is an incarnation of God. There are many incarnations, of course, but um, um, there are specific indications given in the scriptures of um, the incarnations. So hopefully we get time to go to that. Otherwise, we'll take that on next week. Okay, so what are the current modern day thinking? So this universe came into existence out of nothing. However, because nothing is inherently unstable, something has to come from it. And what came from it was the universe that surrounds us. This is a sort of logic that many of the world's leading scientists have, which actually makes very, very little sense. Common arguments given by atheists about why God doesn't exist. We can't see him, so he doesn't exist. So it, it, the reference there is the Bhagavad Gita, BG, and 16 chapter eight was sort of, um, is where Krishna describes the mentality of the atheists. Now that uh, argument, I can't see God, so he doesn't exist doesn't really um, resonate very well. We can't see what's beyond the wall behind me here. Does it mean doesn't ex nothing exists there? No, it's our senses are limited. And the example here is uh, the frog in the well. We are like the frogs in the well. One day, um, the frog who lives in the ocean came to see the frog in the well and the frog in the well was very inquisitive. He said, where you live, how big is the water, the ocean? So the frog in the ocean, he said, it's huge, massive. So he's, the frog in the well said, well, is it 10 times bigger than this well? No, no, much, much, much bigger. 20 times, 100 times. No, far bigger, millions of times bigger. And the frog in the well thought, no, how can that be even possible? So we are perhaps a little bit like that. We are a frog in the well. We can't really see beyond our little existence. Uh, and to contemplate something much greater is hard for us to understand. So another argument by the atheists, everything happens by chance. This is the famous uh, Big Bang theory. <laughs> Everything happens by chance. So there was this uh, French philosopher, uh, Jacques Monod, who wrote in 1970, a book on chance. So this is actually um, won him a Nobel Peace, Peace Prize, would you believe? Nothing exists, 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 everything existing in the universe is the fruit of chance and necessity. <laughs> there was, uh, this is, a, this is him again, um, he's you know, this famous quote, a totally blind process can by definition lead to anything. It can even lead to the vision itself. I mean, the logic is absolutely 
crazy. And then, of course, we have a famous Darwin, the Darwin theory, um, how he talks about the evolution of the species. And I won't read this, but basically his idea is that the bear keeps his mouth open long enough to um, eat the insects, he can turn into a whale in due, in due course of time. So that comes from the origin of species. But he himself, in a letter that he wrote to one of his students, he says, to suppose that the eye, the eye that we see with, could be formed by evolution seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree. There are things which can never be explained, uh, especially through the process of evolution. Now, this fellow is really interesting, Fred Hoyle, another scientist. He's the one who actually coined the term Big Bang Theory <laughs> as a joke. He was, he was a scientist, but he had a little broader vision. And when he heard about the Big Bang, or, you know, that everything happened because of an explosion some time ago, and from that explosion came this fantastic order. He coined the term Big Bang Theory as a joke. And of course, he was vilified by the scientific community. And then um, he, um, he sort of modified his, uh, his, his thought process. And eventually the uh, phrase Big Bang Theory uh, caught and on. So what does he have to say? We must now admit to ourselves that the possibility of life arising by chance, by evolution, is the same probability of throwing six in dice five million consecutive times. So he's very skeptical of this Big Bang by chance theory. And then he's got another quote, which is even better. Uh, let's be scientifically honest with ourselves. The probability of having life arise to greater and greater complexity and organization by chance is the same probability of having a tornado tear through a junkyard and form out the other end, a Boeing 707, 747, which is impossible. So uh, the scientists themselves um, have great doubts within their own community that everything happened by chance. There's no need for God, another argument, because now we have explained all phenomena and there's this uh, reference to 16.9. I can't remember exactly what that is. Let me just have a quick look at it. What are the, this is what Krishna says about um, those who talk about, um, who are sort of uh, not uh, uh, believing in God. Um, following such conclusions, the demoniac, who are lost to themselves and who have no intelligence, engage in unbeneficial, horrible works meant to destroy the world. So because they, the atheists, don't believe in God, it doesn't matter. Anything can happen. If anything goes, no problem. So all phenomena are easily to explain. So we can explain the tsunami which comes because of an earthquake. It's not because of God. It's because Mother Nature works its way, and we can understand everything now. And that's one of the arguments that they use. No need for God anymore. We understand everything. If he exists, why is there suffering in this world? Actually, this is a good question. And there's a story behind, we can explain why there is suffering in this world. There was a barber, there's a, this is a true story actually, a barber in Calcutta who um, gave free haircuts and um, this, the man who was sitting uh, in that uh, barber shop, he was arguing with this, the barber that there is no God. Um, and the barber would say, yes, there is a God. No, there is no God. There is no God. Why do you say that? The barber asked him. Because if there was God, there would be no suffering. Okay. Anyway, um, later on, uh, that um, the man, uh, he, he, the the barber, he came to um, 
the, the man who's sitting in the chair. And he said to him, actually, there are no barbers in this world. There's no barbers in this world. Look at that man there. He's got long hair. Look at that man there. He's got such a long beard. There's no barbers in this world. So the man who was sitting there in the chair, who's thinking, what do you mean there's no barber? You're a barber. And they, because they're not coming to you, they've got long hair, long beards. So the, the barber said to him, that's exactly the point. Because people don't approach God, there is suffering in this world. It's natural. Just like uh, there are barbers in this world, but nobody wants to come and have their hair cut. So don't say there's no barbers. They don't, don't say there's no God. There is God. And just because there is suffering in this world doesn't mean there's no, doesn't mean that God doesn't exist. So it, if we approach God, then um, we will slowly understand that this suffering is very temporary and it's not really suffering because the soul never suffers. And there's another example of Arthur Ashe. Now he was uh, maybe some of the older uh, people in this group, uh, in this uh, session, will understand, uh, will know him. He was the first black uh, tennis player to win uh, Wimbledon. So he was one time diagnosed with cancer. So, and he was asked by the newspaper uh, uh, editor, he said, I asked him, um, you know, do you, do you blame God for um, your disease. So why, why does God have to select you for such a bad disease? Right? That was the question that was asked to him. So Arthur Ashe replied, all over the world, 50 million children start playing tennis. Out of them, 5 million learn um, to play tennis properly. Out of them, half a million learn professional tennis. And a tenth of them come to the circuit who actually get onto the professional circuit. Of that, 10% come to the Grand Slam to compete. 50 of them reach Wimbledon. Four come to the semi-final, two come to the final. And when I was holding the cup, when I won Wimbledon, I never asked God, why me? <laughs> so today in my pain, I shall not be asking God, why me? This is really fascinating, fascinating. Okay, God was introduced to make people moral. So that's another argument that's raised by the atheist. There's no God, it's actually just introduced to scare people to be good. <laughs> now, I think everybody in this form probably believes in God, but it's important to analyze these arguments so that our faith becomes stronger in the Supreme Lord. We have to make sure we are strong. Then we can, if we ever come across these arguments, we can counteract them, at least within ourselves, so that we don't get convinced <laughs> by these arguments. It also will give us a better understanding. And it's not just gonna be a sentimental understanding. Oh yeah, there is God, I love him. But actual understanding, why there is God, and um, how this creation works. Yeah, and these are references which uh, I'll share uh, on the group, but it's worth just cross-referencing to, to the uh, Bhagavad Gita verses. We can also help convince others about the existence of God if we want to. And this is really important because in this verse, Krishna says, there's nobody more dear to me than one who explains this secret of God to the devotees. What are the counter arguments to what we've just uh, given? Well, creation <laughs> means creator, right? If there's a creation, it means there has, there has to be somebody creating it. For example, it's Mona Lisa. I don't think Leonardo da Vinci threw a bit of paint at um, the canvas. wall or canvas and suddenly this beautiful, beautiful uh, painting of Mona Lisa came up. Similarly, this beautiful landscape here, the painting, somebody here was behind it to paint it, just like there is somebody behind it to produce it in the first place. So who is this artist? Who is this painter 
who's producing this wonderful nature of ours, right? Do we know of any building that didn't have a builder? Do we know of any painting that didn't have a painter? Do we know of any car that didn't have a maker? No. So this uh, society, this uh, country, this world, this whole universe has such fantastic creation order in it. So there has to be, when, there's, uh, when there are laws, there has to be a law maker, right? How can there be a law if there is no law maker? How can there be such order if there is no person to put that order into place in the first place? And Newton, he was a very really interesting personality. Uh, one time, Newton had his conference with his scientists. And uh, the day before, he produced this wonderful uh, uh, solar system, solar system a, a replica of the solar system. And when the scientists came to him, he said, they said, they asked him, how did you produce this? It's so beautiful. He said, well, I just threw up some yes. balls in the air and this beautiful creation came about. And the scientist pulled his leg, how is that possible? You must have done a lot of hard work. And he said to them, yes, I did. Just like God has produced this wonderful universe through his wonderful hard work. Mm -hmm. This most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and co uh, comets can only uh, proceed from the counsel and domination of an intelligent and powerful being. So some of the greatest scientists um, accept the concept of uh, a superior being in charge of everything. Every machine has a maker. Do you think such a complex machine just came out by chance? And this is nothing. If we look at the complexity of nature in this world, <laughs> just look at the complexity of our body, just one cell perhaps, it's just phenomenal. And we are thinking everything happened by chance, one explosion, big bang, fantastic. So design and order at the atomic, molecular, and cosmic level. There are, uh, is an explanation for everything. And if you look at uh, Stephen Hawking, who passed away, I think last year, the more we examine the universe, we find it not arbitrary at all, but obeys certain well-defined laws that operate in different areas. It seems very reasonable to suppose that there may be some unifying principle. Now, of course, he was a great atheist, but even then, there is always going to be some doubt because of the wonderful creation. We see order and systematic arrangement in the universe. How can that be? Only through, only through uh, a hand behind everything. And similarly, Krishna says uh, in the Bhagavad Gita 7 7, just like uh, if you see a string of beads, you don't see the thread, but you see the beads beautifully put together. So similarly, you don't see the hand of God, but it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And this is it. Oh, conqueror of wealth, there is no truth superior to me. Everything rests upon me as pearls are thread. Strong. Uh, sorry, are strung on a thread. Correct. So very important. Just because we don't see the thread, we don't see Krishna's hand behind everything, the God's hand, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And there's always a tendency to worship, right? There's always a tendency to worship. <laughs> of course, nowadays with the world of mobile selfies. phones and selfies, our tendency to worship ourselves is only ever defeated by a willing, active, consistent worship of God. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll be worshiping ourselves. So definition of God. Um, who is God or what is God? Right? There's a lot of a lot of different thoughts. Some say God is light, right? Um, the light emanating from uh, within the spiritual sky. God is force. God is everything. I'm not going to argue against any of these points because they're all true. But some argue you and I are God. So to a degree that might be true. You and I are little controllers. We're not the ultimate God, but we are small, tiny little controllers. So what exactly is God and the definition of God? So this is given in the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna gives the definition of God in these different verses. God is the source of everything. 10.8 says, Aham Sarvasupabhavo. 
I am the source of the spiritual and material worlds. So Krishna lays it out very clearly in the Bhagavad Gita. God is complete and is perfect. 10.12, this is Arjun explaining about Krishna's position. God is a supreme controller in the 18th chapter, 61st verse. God is the supreme prior, prior, uh, proprietor and enjoyer, 529. God knows everything, is omniscient. And again, these are references in the Bhagavad Gita. So these are the different uh, qualities and definition of God. In the Vishnu Puran, it explains, you know, says, Aishwaryasya samagrasya viryasya yashasasriya Jnana vairagyo yaschaiva snanam bhaga itin ganaha. The translation is full wealth, strength, fame, beauty, knowledge, and renunciation. These are the six opulences of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So uh, that's actually the definition of Bhagavan. Um, Bhagavan means full of wealth, strength, fame, beauty, knowledge, and renounced as well. That's the definition of God given in the Vishnu Purana. So let's evaluate who is God. There's many who do claim to be God, especially in Bharat. Right? Do they meet the above categories, the criteria set out in Vishnu Purana? So who is God? Okay. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna declares himself to be God. Right? He very openly declares himself. Generally speaking, when, the, when God comes to our world, he doesn't always declare it. He sometimes just comes like as Ram. He came as an ordinary human being, but his pastimes uh, and the scriptures explain that this is actually the Supreme Lord. But just to make it clear, especially for the age of Kali Yuga, Krishna makes it very, very clear in the Bhagavad Gita. He declares that he is God. In the Gita, many references um, are given of Krishna's position. Arjun also makes the same declaration, uh, 10th chapter, 12th verse. As do the sages led by Narad Muni. Now, is there one God or is there many God? And, and we also look at uh, different aspects of, of what, what a God is. Is there one God or is there many gods? So this is often a point of uh, hot discussion, especially in our community. There, are, there is one God, one God with a G, capital G, but there are also many gods with its small g, small gods, if you like, demigods or semigods or devatas, you may know them as. One supreme God, many demigods. And this is described again in uh, Bhagavad Gita 10.2. Is an example given in the holy books is of a king and the ministers. We have a king, we, in this country, we have a queen who appoints a prime minister, who appoints a cabinet. So in the same way, to run the whole universe, and that this is just to run a country, to run the whole universe, the Supreme Lord appoints a prime minister. His name is Brahma. He's in charge of the creation. And there are many officers or devatas or demigods who are in charge of different aspects of this universe, running the universe. And just like these are positions, these are positions of treasury, defense and home and prime minister, they're all, they're all positions. So there's a position of creator and destruct, destruction uh, electric, oh, this is a little different. Shiva is a little different uh, aspect, which we'll talk about in one of our sessions. But these are all positions. Sun God, the uh, moon. moon God, yeah, um, the God in charge of rain, rain, which is Indra. These are all positions which are filled by the most capable personalities in the universe. Just like in this country, we have these positions filled by uh, so-called capable people. But um, these personalities are truly capable and they're appointed specifically to help the Lord maintain order in the universe. 
What about this Trimurti? Because we have the concept of Brahma, Vishnu, uh, Shiva. So who are they? Vishnu is regarded to be uh, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, right? An incarnation of Krishna. Now you may have understood it the other way, which is fine. We don't argue with that because whether you accept Krishna or Vishnu, it doesn't matter because they're both the Supreme, one God, just different expansions. Lord Shiva is in a category of his own. And again, as I said, we'll tackle this in one session because it's such a, a amazing topic to understand. But when Vishnu wants to touch this world, he transforms into Shiva and is a unique position. Nobody can become Shiva as opposed to Brahma. Anybody can become Brahma. Of course, it takes some doing to become Brahma. Um, because it's a very high level position in the universe. But any jiva can attain this, whereas Shiva's position is unique. No jiva, no, none of us can attain the position of Shiva. He's in a unique category. So we'll talk about that especially in one session. So if, if we can just summarize that, Lord um, Brahma is a jiva, Lord Shiva, is a transformation of Vishnu when he wants to be in connection with this world. Otherwise, Vishnu has no connection with this world. So when he comes, he brings his full spiritual entourage with him. But when he wants to do work of destruction or whatever it may be, he will transform into Shiva. So in one sense, Shiva and Vishnu are very close. But in another sense, they're also different because when Shiva is in touch with the Supreme Lord, then uh, with the material world, when Vishnu is in touch with the material world, he becomes Shiva. Brahma, the topmost living entity, he declares, Ishwara Parama Krishna, Ishwara Parama Krishna, Sachidananda Vigraha, Panade Radhe Govinda, Sarva Karana Karanam. Translation. Krishna, who is known as Govinda, is a supreme goddess. He has an eternal, blissful spiritual body. He is the origin of all. He has no other origin, and he is the prime cause of all causes. So we've got a few minutes. Um, does God have a form, or is he impersonal? This is a question which is often asked. Are we limiting God by giving him a form, or is he formless? So... What about the expansions of God, the avatars of God? How do we distinguish the real avatars? So the formless and uh, form, we'll again handle that, talk about that in one session. It's not something that uh, we can just give it one minute because they are both aspects of the absolute truth. So, but in order to understand that better, it'll take a little time. How do we distinguish the real avatars? Well, they're predicted in the scriptures in advance. So Kalki Avatar is already predicted to appear at the end of Kali Yuga. Lord Buddha was predicted and he has already appeared. So these are, avatars are predicted, as is Krishna, as is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And this is a, a verse in the Padma Puran. Kale Patama Sandhyayam Gorango Tamahitale Sachi Sutaha. I should take birth as the son of Sachi, assuming a golden form in a beautiful place on the bank of Bhagirati, Ganga, on the earth in the first part of Kali Yuga. So uh, there are many, many references. There's maybe about 50, 60 references of this hidden incarnation who came 500 years ago, just over 500 years ago. So first qualification of the avatars, prediction is predicted in scriptures. Second, they perform extraordinary pastimes, which attracts everyone. Lifting of Govardhan Hill comes to mind with Krishna. They give divine knowledge as the Supreme Lord did when he came in the form of Krishna. He gave the Bhagavad Gita, amongst other um, uh, transcendental knowledge. They may even show their Virat Rup, the universal form, at least if they're requested, they will show it for sure. 
And which is exactly what happened when Arjun requested Krishna, please show me your universal form. So if you see an avatar standing around in the street corner and he's claiming to be avatar, ask him to show him his Virat form. He'll probably say, no, nah, that's okay. You know, um, Krishna did it and uh, I don't need to show you. Um, but uh, they won't, nobody can show that unless the Supreme Lord. And they have a particular mission when they, dis they descend. It's not that just, they just turn up and they chill out and enjoy with the ladies, which is what vast majority of the avatars tend to do. Um, they tend to enjoy, to take advantage of people's simplicity um, and exploit people. They also have bodily signs on their palms and soles. So this is an example of Krishna's lotus feet. The, the soles of his feet have various symbols. And these are described in the holy books. Krishna is described to be the source of all the avatars. Krishna stood but once when in the Srimad Bhagavatam. So it's... Sorry? I think we just got one bit more to do, so we just finish it. I think is Krishna a Hindu god? <laughs> is he or is he God for everybody? When we say Krishna, that's a name of the Supreme Lord, but he can equally be known as Allah, he can equally be known as Christ. Why not? One God, just we know him by different names, just like water is known by different names in different cultures and different religions. Krishna means all attractive, very beautiful. Allah means all powerful. So the question which we can ask is, do you think Allah is all attractive? Yes, the answer will be. So God can be also called Krishna because Krishna means all attractive. <laughs> but we shouldn't just confuse Krishna with the demigods. The demigods are very powerful servants of the Supreme Lord and they're also his devotees. So we don't disrespect them, but we have to understand that we should not confuse the Supreme Lord with his servants. All qualities of God are included in the name of Krishna, the highest conception. This is again described in the Brahma Samhita. So I wanted to stop there. And it's a pretty fast run through um, this subject. And we definitely can't give it the quality of time that is required in order to go through the, uh, all the aspects. That was a very brief run through. And uh, we are happy to take questions. Uh, it may, some of what we've said may not resonate well uh, because of the traditions that you may have been following in the past. I understand that. Um, and certainly we're not here to cause any controversy, but I'm happy to take questions if anybody has any. Where's our dynamic duo, Ishwari and Kishori? We don't actually have any questions today. No way! What happened? We were just listening and trying to take it all in. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Priti. Yes, Priti. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhu, for the class. Um, I was going to ask, what do the Vedas say who God is? Because like we've heard a lot from mm. Srimad Bhagavat and Padma Puran, but like mm. just general. Yeah. Mm. Very good question. Vedas generally um their topics are based around the devatas and the specific um boons that one can receive from the devatas the vedas are mainly aimed at the persons who are materialistically still wanting um, oh sorry Mo materialistically wanting to improve in life so instead of them um, improving or getting more material gains simply by their own effort, the Vedas guides them. Okay, you want uh, wealth, approach Varun Dev. You want 
to be strong approach value you want um, fame then approach the ashwini twins so effectively the way it does it will point mostly to the demigods to for for the, the, the for the person to worship the demigods lord the supreme lord is there uh, in the vedas but slightly hidden not given the full um exposure because the vedas wants to address all the different types of uh, desires that people have so that they can actually link with somebody more superior than themselves in order to obtain those desires um but in the in the if we look at the commentary of the vedas which is the shrimad bhagavad puran is very very clear and in fact the chapter we did last this friday um very very clearly explains chapter 3 of the second canto especially verses 2 to 7 sukadev goswami explains all the different devatas that one should approach if you want specific boons but if you want to go back to godhead if you want the ultimate benefit you can only approach vishnu or or, or the supreme personality of god krishna like that generally speaking the vedas will not will will look at the fruitive aspects of uh vedic traditions sacrifices not necessarily uh self realization per se so he god is somewhat supreme personality god is somewhat hidden in the vedas but he's brought out through the upanishads through the puranas to the itihasis he's brought out in that way Which, thanks for you which um actual text coming next from the vedas would actually talk about god like who is god his features uh from the vedas itself yeah the next in line you know like cuz we've heard like after uh, the vedas was too complicated so then came a next oh, up into so many and then so many yeah the next would be the puranas i suppose uh, i mean there's there are the vedangas and the which all sort of give more explanation how to pronounce the verses and uh how to do the sacrifice but the ones that explain the vedas um in a more contextual way are the puranas so the puranas are the 18 uh, main puranas and then we look at just the one purana which is the bhagavad puran shrimad bhagavad puran uh, bhagavatam which uh, is a, is a described to be the natural commentary of of the vedas who, who says that yeah like who says who that, says that? Uh, that's actually in the shrimad bhagavatam itself uh, yeah. shri vyasdev shri vyasdev wrote the vedas but he all subsequently right at the end he wrote the shrimad bhagavatam and when he wrote the vedas or when he spoke the vedas to ganpati he wasn't very satisfied so his spiritual master narad muni came and he explained to him you're not happy yes i know why you're not happy even though you've written the vedas you've not happy because you have not described in full the supreme personality of godhead so now your opportunity is to uh, write the shrimad bhagavatam or dictate the shrimad bhagavatam which will be in which he is described as the natural commentary of the vedas and how you will become happy so that is in the first canto is that, that is the description given thank you prabhu thank you for your questions very good ishwari ishwari um why does god send avatars down to earth instead of coming himself he does come himself and his avatars are not different from him one in the same they're one in the same right so if we for example are very inclined to ram ram is an avatar according to um the bhagavatam and according to the brahma samhita but if somebody is a devotee of ram is he any less than one who is a devotee of krishna himself no hanuman the greatest servant of ram is one of the greatest devotees of the lord right so um 
whether Krishna comes himself or he sends his avatars really doesn't make too much difference. Whoever one is inclined towards, Hanuman was very inclined towards Ram. Even he met Krishna and he said, I love my Ram. <laughs> so in many ways, it doesn't matter. They're one and the same. Um, but one may have more you know, like inclination towards a particular avatar. Um, or he may have a particular inclination to the supreme, like uh, the original uh, personality of Godhead. But it doesn't matter because ultimately, if they are one and the same, whether it's the original or the avatar, it is they are one and the same in one sense. Thank you. Um, if the Lord created everything, why did he create atheists? Um, because there are people, he will fulfill the desires of everyone. So if one desires to uh, not know God, he will fulfill that desire. That's what he does. That's the only thing we can do. Only thing we have are our desires. And God is like the ultimate parent. He will fulfill the desires of the children, but he'll do it in such a way that ultimately, this world is perfectly imperfect. Whatever we try to do in this world, we will not attain perfection. In fact, the opposite, we will always fail, right? But it's designed in that way so that ultimately, it's like, the, it's like your father and mother giving you a toy phone. You know, they know it ain't gonna work, right? <laughs> but you're gonna use it, you're little, you, and ultimately, when you grow up, you'll have a proper phone. So in the same way, uh, it's not quite exactly a right example, but this world is very false. But um, what, how the way God has designed it is, is so false that ultimately we will take shelter of him. Even the atheists at some point, um, or even it's, if it's at the right, the end of their life, or maybe in another life, Ultimately, they will come to the stage of accepting, ah, there must be a God. Because of the failings of this world, you know, we, 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 you're destined to fail in this world if we want to enjoy materially. And our last question, why do other people claim themselves God? Right, for power, fame, to exploit people, to cheat people, to um, try to enjoy, like God. Um, one of the reasons why we're in this world, original reasons, is because we became envious of God. We wanted to become God. So um, he gives that opportunity as well. Some people, okay, you know, they can produce a little bit of ash from nowhere and suddenly people are thinking, oh yeah, this must be God. And he, him, that person himself will be saying, yes, I am God. But actually, um, that's unless they qualify within the parameters of what we were talking about, described in the scriptures and produce, uh, they do amazing acts and, you know, different uh, symbols are within their body, then they will not be regarded as Supreme Lord, as avatars either. But it's basically to enjoy, and this is our biggest problem. Uh, just want to comment here uh, by okay. Harish. It is like a son wants to leave this, uh, leave separately to his father because of his own desires. Yes, very very good point. Very good point. Okay, uh, thank you, Ishwari Kishori and uh, Akasha or Riha. Hare Krishna, Prabhuji and Mataji. Why do you leave other people when they say they're God? Why? Yeah. Why do people believe? Others when they say they're God. Right. There's something in this world called the cheaters and the cheated. <laughs> some people, unfortunately, are destined to be cheated and some are che cheaters. And sometimes we put faith because uh, of whatever situation we're in we put faith in somebody who says i i am god i can solve your problems 
But actually they can't. If they're not God, they can't solve any problems. They'll create more problems. Why do people fall for it? Desperation. Yeah. Desperation. Uh, wanting to follow somebody, something. So Ig ignorance as well. Ignorance. Yeah, ignorance. Family tradition. My father did it, so I do it. Uh, many, many reasons come to mind. But we should be very careful. We should be very careful. In perfect senses. Yeah, thank you, Arish. Maybe you should be doing the class. <laughs> <huh>? <laughs> thank you so much. We're not perfect. We not. We may get fooled very easily. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, also, if someone dies and they go to the heavenly abode, how long do they stay for? And uh, when will they be reincarnated on the earth again? They can stay a long time. 10,000 years, 20,000 years, 30,000 years, depend on their karma. When the good oh. karma is finished, they'll end up back on earth again. So, but they have long periods of life there. 100,000 years, depends on exactly which heavenly planet one goes to and what one has done in terms of the good karmic activities. But we don't want to aim for the heavens because ultimately you always come back to earth. Um, so it's a waste of a waste of waste of energy. That energy can be used much better serving the supreme and getting permanent benefit rather than temporary benefit. Very good question. Thank you. So time for uh, and Akash has one more question. Sorry. Okay. No, that's fine. Um, we can take that question. But what I'm just going to ask Kishori and Kishori today, Pali can't make it, but she's very kindly produced the quiz and uh, also very kindly Ishwari and Kishori are, are going to host it. So I think they've already put, ah, well done, on the chat, they've put the website, which is quiz and the password is there as well. And when you log in, you'll see the password. Uh, I think you see the password 621768. Oh, you won't see the password, but that's the password, 621768. So everyone can log on? You can log on and we'll take on some questions. And Ishwari and Kishwari, you're welcome to share your screen. Huh? Yes, Akasha, go ahead. Um, okay, one second, <laughs> she's coming. She just went to go get her question. No right. Yeah, she's here again. Like Riha said, um, so does that mean if you go to the heavenly planets, you stay there for less and go to um, the lower planets, you stay for much more longer? Uh, the lower planets, it well depends. In the heavenly planets, you have a limit of time. In the lower planets, generally, um, we wouldn't generally go that direction. We would go on the higher planets. Lower planets are those who um perhaps we'll go there to get punished or to associate with the, their ancestors so it's in terms of timings i'm not too sure how long they would stay there do you know no we're not too sure mm -hmm. about that but i mean some lower planets lower than earth again you can stay a long time mm. uh but um we would usually go to the hellish planets not uh, which are lo even lower than the 14 uh, planetary systems uh, for a little while only and then come back to earth again but the okay. other other, other uh, uh, six lower planets than uh, which are lower than earth are usually you know long duration of life again hmm. but generally the, we the um, people who do pious activities hmm. would not go there they would go in the heavenly planets okay Thank, Thank you. you. Interesting question, that one. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, anybody to join? Anybody to join? What about you, me? Okay, we're waiting for you. <laughs> Thank you. Wait, wait, are you playing? Are you playing? Are you playing? Are you playing? Are you Otherwise, we can make a start. Should I start, Prabhuji? 
Um, just, just one second. Um, I'm gonna, I wanna put JNT in here. Uh, where are you? Get started. Into the code. Into the code. 61. Oh, 61. So let me do it today. I can't see the game pin. It's a 621. 768. Okay, Rojan joining us. Okay, so am I six two one seven six eight seven six eight. All right. So yes, you yes. can start. Huh? Thank you. What is the spiritual name for Krishna's abode? Mahesh Dham, Hari Dham, Golok, Ayodhya. Uh, the answer was go look. One breath of Vishnu is how many years long? One hundred thousand, three hundred thousand, three hundred and eleven trillion and forty billion, three hundred and eleven billion. The answer was three hundred and eleven trillion and forty billion. When the Lord breathes in, the universe is destroyed. The universe is created, it does not affect us. If one remembers Krishna at the time of death, they will attain the Supreme, they will be liberated, they will be born into a religious family, they will, they will be born in a wealthier family. Oh, there's a very close between the first two. They were both right, the first two. Gully Yu consists of how many years? and 32,000 was the correct answer. Currently, what time would it be for Brahma? 12, 11.28 a.m., 1 p.m., unmeasurable. So was 11.28 a.m. What is the oldest religion?
everybody got that right. That's very good. What is the newest religion? Christianity, Jainism, Sikhism, Islam. Majority got it correct. India is the religion of origin to Sanatana Dharma, Sikhism and Jainism, Buddhism, all of the above. All of the above. Last question. One Deva Yuk is Satya Yuk, Satya and Treta Yuk, all except Kali Yuk, all four Yuks. Majority got it right. Third, second, first. <laughs> Should I stop sharing? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you did that very, very nicely. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes. If anybody has any final questions, um, otherwise we can end the session. I'd like to thank everybody for joining. Hope you found it useful. And um, any, any feedback that you'd like to uh, put through, you can put it on the chat here or you can uh, send it to me directly any way we can uh, do it differently or better please do let us know huh? thank you so much okay i'll keep this open chat open for five minutes so if there's anything that you want to uh, feedback please do that thank you so much otherwise we look forward to seeing everybody next sunday Hare Krishna, at one o'clock one Quarter to one. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Well done. Thank you, Guruji. Thank you, Burmata. Who's that? This is Shamla. Hare Krishna, Shamla. Thank you so much for joining. You. You're finding Thank it useful? You. Yes, uh, it is. Uh, uh, it's very nice. Even today, even my husband uh, was listening and we were very impressed, I have oh. to say. <laughs> and, and he answered some of the quiz questions. <laughs> oh, okay, good, good. Yeah, good. But where are you based? We are in Montreal, Canada. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. Welcome. Brilliant. Well, thank yeah. you for joining. You. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Hare Krishna. Hare 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 Krishna. Hare Krishna. See you a bit later, hopefully. Yeah? Yes, thank you. Hari Bol. Thank you so much for joining. Hari Krishna.